previous personal assistant of Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan. Take it away, Jim. Thank you so much. I feel like this is a family evening. We're a family, right? And we've come together to honor one of our favorite people on his birthday. And you know, since we love Ronald Reagan so much, um, and if you were going to a birthday party for someone you love, you'd have a lot of good things to say about it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're talking about tonight, and I'm honored to have an opportunity to share some of these experiences that I've had with Ronald Reagan and his wife in the White House with all of you tonight. And I'm gonna begin with some opening remarks, and then I'm happy to stay as long as you'd like and answer questions that you might have. First, I wanna thank Patricia for building this organization. You mentioned the uh, Time for Choosing of the, or the Rendezvous with Destiny speech, which introduced Reagan to the political scene in 1964 when he introduced Barry Goldwater at the Phoenix Convention. And his statements that you quoted from also had a condition attached to them. And it was a call to action, as we've really heard tonight so eloquently from Andrea, and by the way, Patricia has done a magnificent job of building this organization, but watch out for this one over right here. I think you got a taste of it tonight. Uh, but that also figures into uh, just a, something I want to say at the outset here. I think that this condition that Ronald Reagan set was that we need to preserve, we need to protect, and we need to communicate the values that we hold dear and not to preserve them just for our own country and for our own benefit, but for the rest of the world. Because the more democracy we have in the world, the safer Americans are. The light that was referred to here tonight that we have as the shining city on a hill, which was first introduced uh, through Governor Bradford when he landed on the shores of Massachusetts, and which other presidents have also picked up on, by the way, but Reagan really used as his theme song, if that light grows dim, the rest of the world sinks into chaos. We need to keep that light burning. And again, that's another condition that Ronald Reagan set for us. And the question really is, are we going to keep that light burning? Uh, and I think that in making reference to that, Patricia, as you did so wisely, I think each of us has to answer that in, in our own hearts. But I think that the purpose that you've set for this lecture series and Andrea is so capably going to carry and broaden into the future, is also very much in line with the way Re Ronald Reagan held his responsibility. You know, he was the most uh, communicating, he was called, of course, the great communicator, he was dubbed that by the media, but he was also not only the great communicator, but he was the great communicating president because he gave more presidential press conferences, he spoke to the American people more from the Oval Office than any president in history. And he devoted himself to really explaining his initiatives, his policies, and his beliefs to the broadest possible uh, community that he could find. And he believed that if he could only reach the hearts and minds of Americans, he could convince them to join him in this battle to preserve liberty. And he really wanted, and I'll, I'll share a little more of this details of this with you in a minute, but he really wanted to not have a filtered approach to communicating. Wherever we went, he preferred not to have his message delivered through the media or through someone else. He preferred to speak directly to the people, and that's exactly why he had as many Oval Office addresses as he did. I remember the, the beginning, at the beginning of the last uh, talk that he gave from the Oval Office, which was his constituted his farewell with America from uh, at the end of, the, of his uh, second term in the White House, some of the uh, speech was prepared by Peggy Noonan, and she recounts how she was in the Oval Office at the beginning of the uh, broadcast, and she said to another one of our colleagues, um, is he okay, is he okay? And she, because he had, he had put his head down um, lowered his head before the uh, cameras, before the cameras started rolling. And the person, this other colleague of ours said to her, oh no, he always does that. He's just praying. So when Ronald Reagan ended every Oval Office speech and he said, and God bless America, 
The reason that Americans understood and accepted the fact that Reagan wanted God to bless America is because that's what he felt in his heart. So a part of his being called a great communicator was that he actually believed what he was saying. He wasn't merely mouthing the brilliant words of, of speech, very experienced speech writers. He actually believed what he was saying. So tonight, I really want to talk about something maybe a little bit different, but I think acutely important to not only what we need to do, but what I think this lecture series can do. Um, and and uh, as I mentioned, I'm really honored to uh, be here to be invited tonight and to share a few thoughts with you about our 40th president and my years with him in the White House. Talking about Reagan is always a pleasure, as I said, because there's so many good things to say about him, which reminds me of how often I was asked you know, uh, if you remember, Nancy Reagan often very carefully, because she was well-trained, as was the president, uh, attending and giving many presentations, that you are to look at the person who's making the presentation, especially if you're, if you're accompanying him. And I was often asked, also in, also in a way, in a tiresome way, by journalists, well, is that adoring glance that Nancy Reagan always fixes on the president, is that real? Uh, if you remember, she would always look at him intently, as you would if you were honoring someone who was speaking. But I was asked that so many times. Is that a real and sincere glance that she's the way she's holding him uh, in her thought and, and in her glance? And I was asked that for so many years that I finally said, well, it, it, they would say, well, does she really love the president that much? And of course, I always dutifully answered yes, because they did have a wonderful marriage and a great compact between them. So finally, after years, I just gave up and I said, look, I love Ronald Reagan. I give him that kind of adoring glance as well. So why shouldn't she? So tonight, we're gonna give him an adoring glance, but we're gonna do it looking forward and in a, in a realistic way. Uh, for his values. So I noticed on social media today, uh, because of the president's birthday, that people were obviously uh, making statements, making you know, remarks about Ronald Reagan and his 105th birthday. And I was especially touched by this one post uh, that said, I wasn't even born until after you were elected, but you're still my favorite. And I, I thought that this echoes the experience I've had walking down city streets and in and out of political campaigns where people talk about Reagan, typically with respect, but often also with curiosity. They know something about what he accomplished and how he was a massive winner of elections, but they don't really know much about his mysterious inner character because he didn't really talk about that. It's what he kept locked up inside. And we're going to discuss a little bit about why he kept it locked up inside, uh, because I was of two minds about it, whether it was really going to work or not, but that's the way he did it. It was this character that actually led us to these foreign and domestic policy successes. And also, it is important to learn more about the man and then to communicate it broadly so that more of our future leaders will be able to emulate him and to become leaders in their own right along the, the pattern that Reagan set for us. So again, to come back to what you've begun here, Patricia, and what you're gonna continue and broaden, I think every community needs a Ronald Reagan lecture series. Why, why do they need it? Because generally, I think conservatives do an extremely poor job, and you mentioned this as well, of communicating these values. And most importantly, linking them to what's most important to people today. So we need to communicate. We need to really follow the example of Reagan, but we need to explain it. And Reagan is a convenient vehicle for us to use to communicate because he was generally a bridge politician. So he was beloved by Democrats and liberals, uh, looking one 49 states in 1984. So he was beloved by both sides. Uh, today we have tremendous division that's been really foisted on, on our country. Uh, but Ronald Reagan was a bridge communicator. 
We need to be better bridge communicators. We need to address the hearts and minds of all the American people, not just conservatives. We need to listen to them, but we need to be very effective in telling them, explaining to them what American values are. Um, I think it was also very interesting to hear uh, a young person who had been in New Hampshire address the question of a journalist, well, why do you support uh, Bernie Sanders? And sometimes I have to say, personally, I'm, I'm listening to some of these candidates and I'm thinking, what country are they running for president in? Because it seems that it's, it's not the country that I know. But in any case, um, he said, oh, well, because I'd like my country to be more like Sweden. And so the, the journalist, I think who was from Fox, said, well, do you know what life in Sweden is like? And has Sweden ever sent a man to the moon? And he said, well, our country hasn't either. You have to realize that there is tremendous ignorance. There's tremendous ignorance because our schools do not teach our, uh, the history of our country uh, in the right way. They don't teach constitutional law. Uh, and of course, values have been completely driven out of the educational system. And these are things that, you know, we're not going to bring back these things into public education, but I think it falls on us, it's incumbent on us to act like Ronald Reagan and communicate as, as bridge communicators. I think it's tremendously important. So I think it's very important that we've come together tonight to celebrate our president's birthday, and I'll tell you why. Let's get really close together on this. Okay, uh, because we're gathering together tonight at a period of national and global crisis. We know that. Uh, but no, not just to consider and celebrate and honor a historic figure of the past, an iconic statue of a once great and gallant standard bearer, one we revere and strive to emulate, even though that might be a valid and worthy exercise. No. We actually come together tonight to consider Reagan's future, to contemplate his strategies, character, role model, and then to apply these not to the dustbin or what he would call the ash heap of history, but to the challenges of today and the bright promises of the future. Promises that must be there because Reagan saw them. Remember Reagan the eternal optimist how many of us could be optimistic today? Well, we need to be, but we need to understand how it was that Reagan was an optimist and what he saw. He saw them in the way that the prophets and the founders and the patriots saw them. We know that because he told us in clear and explicit terms. He talked about them in his last political address in 1992 and surely in his last talk with the American people from the Oval Office, as I mentioned in 1989. And to quote him, what then is our course? Must civilization perish in a hail of fiery atoms? Must freedom wither in a quiet, deadening accommodation with totalitarian evil? Or what we might today call creeping socialism? or in our country the proposed and preposterous global dominance and threat of radical Islam? Must we succumb to and suffer those threats? Ronald Reagan saw a different way. We have to as well. This is all a part of looking into the future. We're here not, again, just to blow out birthday candles to honor someone of the past. We're here to talk about and examine and understand better what made Ronald Reagan great, and then to take those qualities into the future and to really impose them on our future political leaders. You know, today, Ronald Reagan is mentioned uh, an average of 15,000 times a day in the media. He's spoken, his name is spoken by virtually every political candidate uh, that's on the platform today. However, the question is really, do they adopt his character? Do they adopt his strategy or his policies? They like to invoke his name because they think that by association, with Reagan that may shed some borrowed light on them. But I question whether they've really adopted or really even begin to understand who Ronald Reagan really is. But now, exactly how did he see these promises and how can we adopt his lens to see them as well and to adopt his nature as an eternal optimist? 
especially at a time when optimism is not easy to come by, and though it is reminiscent of, to a degree, the way we felt during the last days of Jimmy Carter. Even though the past eight years have dealt a crushing blow to global democracies, economic freedom in our own country, a departure from constitutional values and balance of power, and an intentional division in communities, yes, I still believe, and I'm often asked, Reagan would still be an optimist. How could he be? He still would have held on to the promise and hope because he saw history in a broader perspective. Now this is really key, and a lot of people haven't really gotten this because they never understood that Ronald Reagan was a strategist. The reason they never got it is because he never explained that he was a strategist. He had this broader and deeper perspective, and, and, and it wasn't really in, in relatively short-term politics that I'm talking about. No, he would not tolerate evil, but he would point out the inherent good in our democratic way of life, and especially in our people. And he would tell us we could ultimately prevail over our immediate circumstances and, and challenges. You know, people often told me they thought of Reagan in a grandfatherly way. The way he talked to us, for example, from the Oval Office, I remember that people would think and, and characterize him this way, well, I just had a talk with my dad, or I just had a talk with my grandfather. And in fact, you know, I, I fault myself. You know, Reagan was the oldest person to uh, take the oath of office. I mean, when he became president, actually, he was 70 years old. We thought, those of us that traveled with him and lived and worked with him day in and day out, we didn't really, we, we treated both the Reagans as if they were, I would say, more 30, 35 years old. I mean, we never said, and they never said to us, slow down, you're giving us too much to do, or we can't do this, or we don't have the capacity. I can tell you, I can tell you stories upon stories of going in the, the uh, freight entrance, of, of uh, hotels and hospitals and other public places, and the Reagans were off, often climbing up the stairs, three stairs at a time, because they wanted to exercise, they wanted to stay fit, they had the energy, really, that a lot of Secret Service agents didn't have. So uh, they kept everyone on the staff running, they kept the Secret Service running with tremendous respect. Um, they, they knew that they owed their safety and their well-being to a large extent on the attentiveness of the Secret Service. But here were people that entering uh, office at this stage, I think Reagan had not only the, and I think this is often, he's often shortchanged for this because he's often called, well, he was an actor, he was the actor president. Well, that isn't accurate because he had four careers before he came into the White mm -hmm. House. And as I always say, he had a new numerical leg up. So if you think about uh, coming into, taking on the most important job in the world when you're 70, it's, it's a very different position that you're in. So he had been a sportscaster, he'd been a lifeguard for seven years on the Rock River in Dixon, Illinois, where he saved 77 lives and he was very proud of it. And I think he always thought of himself as a lifesaver. Uh, he had, that was really his first job. Um, he came out of college and became a sportscaster, although he thought of going to uh, Yale Divinity School and become, as I say, a preacher that might have given sermons to hundreds and instead he gave sermons to millions. So he followed a different path. But uh, then he went to become a union organizer and head of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, in addition to being, being an actor and at times having to be a, a floor walker in Las Vegas when his star was diminishing in Hollywood. And then a corporate spokesman for General Electric, where he really really cemented his political beliefs and tried them out on audiences across the country. He spoke at 235 GE factories across the country. And this is where he tried out, and this is also something that people don't really understand about Ronald Reagan. They thought, well, he just burst on the political scene as an actor and he had all these wonderful ideas and he, he was a great communicator. No, he honed them starting in 1964, but even earlier in 1954, in, in a speech I'm going to quote in a couple of minutes at John uh, Woods College where Churchill had spoken in 1946. But he had this kind of public commitment much, much 
before he even contemplated becoming a politician. But as he was riding the rails, as I say, for General Electric, that's when he was writing his own speeches on lined yellow legal pads. And he was trying out all of these theories. And this is where he was migrating. You know, he was the only president who he, he shifted from being a liberal Democrat, supporting Franklin Roosevelt, to a, a conservative. Why did he do that? No one forced him to do that. It was because of what he saw. This is what he saw in Hollywood. He saw with communism, what he saw with the way the, the Liberal Party was, was treating people and the opportunity to do something about it. But it was this migration when he was the corporate spokesman for General Electric that really put him in a position to be able to stand before a televised audience in 1964 in the nomination speech for Barrett Goldwater and actually that night, and it doesn't sound like much now, a million dollars came in because of Ronald Reagan's speech uh, in Phoenix to support Barry Goldwater. This was the critical introduction of Reagan to the rest of the world. Very, very important. So, does Ronald Reagan have a future? And I, I love this, you know, one of the things Reagan loved to say uh, in quoting Alfred uh, Lord Tennyson, he said, uh, quoting Tennyson, who says, come my friends, as Reagan was wont to say, it's not too late to seek a newer world. One of his very favorite things to quote over and over again. So I say, come my friends, let's see how Reagan and his formula for leadership might extend into the future, impact it and improve it, and why we need him, his values, faith, beliefs, and we need him with us into the future. Reagan appointees were called Reaganites, or foot soldiers. Well, I think we need to call up the Reagan militia again. I think that's what you're doing. Okay, the, the, world, the world is calling for the Reagan brand of leadership, and the millennials and the Zers, those are the ones coming after millennials, are, are straining to know it. We must not preserve Reagan's legacy. We must explain it in terms that are useful today and fit for its employment in the policy, politics, and education of our nation. The problem is that while many politicians speak his name, as I said, as if some magical influence will waft down on them, they don't adopt his character. So in order to, to get them to adopt his character, we need to understand it better and explain it. Although over 50% of all millennials have declared that they believe the American dream is over, which is, I, I think, a very tragic thing for our country, they do believe at the same time that anything is possible. What they want, what the millennials want, is impact. Uh, they sort of are, in a way, you remember what Pastor um, uh, Rick Warren called the purpose-driven life. So they think of life as the impact-driven life. They want results and they're impatient about it. I would like to think that Reagan's position on this, Reagan's example, and what he did fits precisely and very well with millennials. This is exactly because millennials are coming into control and power in all the institutions, all the uh, organizations and institutions of life. So in our civic life, in our, in our uh, business and corporate life, millennials are beginning to take over. They are the perfect people to adopt the Reagan legacy and to do something with it because they're impatient and they want to have impact. Reagan was impatient and he wanted to have impact as well. So these are people who were actually born during Reagan's presidency but they didn't really know him, yet they adopted this impatience and this drive to, uh, to impact. And it's also codified in a way in a little uh, gold embossed leather tool uh, plaque that was on Reagan's desk. And you know, Reagan used the Resolute desk, which you may know was given by Queen Victoria to Rutherford B. Hayes. And it was later uh, during FDR, because he wore braces, uh, it had a, it was a partner's desk, it had, so it had a keyhole, and he had it uh, filled in, and with the seal, the great seal of the, of the presidency, and that was the desk that Ronald Reagan used, but on that desk he had a couple of plaques, and one of the plaques said, it can be done. This is, I like to think that both, the desk was called a resolute, because it was made from the, the wood of a uh, trawler that went to Antarctica, it was called the Resolute, and uh, Queen Victoria had this desk made from the wood of that ship. 
I like to think of Ronald Reagan's plaque, it can be done, as a resolution or a resolute statement, really representing uh, Reagan's thought. Uh, as I, and, and as I say, I think that was really a part of his uh, credo. So a part of the, uh, uh, I, I, and I wanted to share what I thought was an example, going back to the millennials, um, uh, Reagan was really speaking to them when he said, the ultimate determinant in the struggle now going on for the world will not be bombs and rockets, but a test of wills and ideals, the trial of spiritual resolve, the values we hold, the beliefs we cherish, and the ideals to which we are dedicated. In this way, as I say, he was really speaking to the impatience of millennials, and I think this is exactly where we need to be. While in office, Reagan's immediate actions were on pressing political and global issues, and yet he was a grand strategist, as I mentioned, but no one really knew that. His plan to end communism began way before coming to Washington and functioned like a quiet yet guiding course right beneath the surface of his character. He campaigned for policy and legislative agendas and the passage of new laws, but he mostly spoke of eternal values. It is these values, along with his example of success in foreign and domestic policy, that we can take into the future. Now let's just look at five of these critical beliefs and how he handled them and why we need them today and into the future. And this is basically just the bulk of my remarks tonight, these five different aspects of his character. And then after I conclude, I'm happy to, as I say, stand and answer any questions you might have. So first of all, Reagan was a uniter. We need uniters and not dividers. He wanted to consolidate power in the American presidency. And he knew that to be successful globally, he had to have a solid base of support with the American people. He knew that he would never have everyone on his side, but he had to have enough, not only to pass his legislative agenda, but to go to war if necessary against foreign intervention in our way of life. Now this is a critical point, and it's lost on a lot of people. Why do you, you know, it was often said, well, Reagan loved the pomp of, of the presidency. Yes, we had marching bands, and he loved it, and he loved every salute that the military, he loved the military, and there isn't a day that when I, and I travel a lot when I meet retired military in particular or active duty military, if they find out that I worked for Reagan, there's just a, a palpable feeling of, of awe and love and respect because that's what Reagan gave them. So, but here's the point. Reagan was not building and sustaining the power of the presidency for his own benefit. He was building it because he knew a strong American presidency was the guiding light and force for the rest of the world. Again, not for personal power or aggrandizement, but because it was the consolidation, the point at which leadership for the rest of the world could be dispatched. And without that kind of power, the rest of the world could fail. That's why one, Ronald Reagan wanted to consolidate power in the country and power in the presidency. He respected the American presidency that much be, because he saw its historical and divine purpose right there vested in that office. Critically important, again, not for his own power, but for the good that he could accomplish in that office. And he, you know, he was criticized for, at times, of course it's nothing compared to what he had for the past eight years, but being the imperial presidency because he loved all of this sort of thing. Well, don't you think one of those instruments of pomp and circumstance went to waste? Mm -hmm. We had more foreign heads of state visiting the White House during the eight years of the Reagans than any president in American history. We had every single month, and they were run out of my office, state visits, working visits, and official visits of foreign heads of state. What was Reagan doing? Remember what I talked about? Reagan was a bridge builder. He was a uniter and he was a bridge builder. He brought those people to Washington. They were uh, serenaded and you know there were parades of, of military and fife and drum and so forth. Do you think one minute of that was wasted on these people? No. This is where communication really was established. And this is where these strong bilateral relationships began. People, some people, some politicians talk about, you know, well, we have to work in 
broad coalitions. We have to, you know, all this sort of thing. Reagan, Reagan never believed that. He believed that he would never, ever, ever abandon or advocate the responsibility of America. He would never give up power to a coalition if he felt that that coalition would in any way waste the liberty and freedom and the ability of America to shine by its light in the rest of the world. That is why working at the United Nations or working in coalitions, which, which he certainly did, he felt that America had to be the leader, and he never gave up on that. And it all started with these bilateral relations that he, that he had. Okay, so that's, that's enough on uniting. Number two, to Reagan, his America was not so much a piece of geography, but a country of ideals. Again, cr critically important. Who talks like this today? Uh, this was way back in 1952, as a matter of fact, at William Woods College, as I mentioned, where Churchill gave that first speech in 1946, which set the term Cold War, which had not been uh, heard before. So he, he goes there and he says, uh, America is less of a place than, a, than, an idea, than an idea. And if it is an idea, and I believe that to be true, it is an idea that has been deep in the souls of man. Now, why is this significant for the future? Because it put the emphasis of American ideals squarely on the, on the Constitution and the institutions it bore, and its rationale and the spirit it bred into our people. If Americans give up these ideals and a striving for them, our country is doomed. Reagan knew this long before he even dreamt of being a politician. Today, there is, as I say, widespread ignorance of our history, its founding, and the essential link between these American values and our freedoms. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, to illustrate this, what this student asked about you know, why he was supporting Bernie Sanders. Number three, okay, so we have Reagan was a uniter. Number two, America is a place of ideals, more than anything else, more than, more than geography or the physical assets of America, our greatest assets are our ideals, our aspirational ideals, uh, based on the founders' <clears throat> beliefs. Number three, Reagan was more a strategist than a tactician. And we need more strategists to handle the complexities of the world. If you look at Syria, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, Libya, the rise of radical Islam, how are we gonna solve these problems in the future? Not by piecemeal tactics. There has to be a grand strategy. And this is exactly how Reagan approached the defeat of Soviet-style communism, through a grand strategy. Uh, and and I'm, I'm gonna give you an example of how he did that. So again, we're on number three. We're talking about being a strategist, not a, just a tactician. Now, there are three different parts to being a strategist. And this is how Reagan did it, and I will, I'm gonna illustrate very, very briefly these, these three points. First is that you have to have beliefs. And these the, the three things basically you have to have beliefs, information, and execution. Now what do I mean by beliefs? So Reagan, in, in this uh, strategy to defeat Soviet-style communism, had a different kind of belief. You saw from the outside the, the tactics were a strong military buildup and a consolidation and uniting of the American people because he had to have a strong domestic economy to be able to go into uh, these foreign theater, theaters, which he did very effectively. This is very important. But he had to have these beliefs, okay. So, uh, one day when we were, this was in, uh, in 1986, which was the first bilateral meeting between um, Reagan and Gorbachev, um, I asked him, we were sitting, we were staying in the villa of the Aga Khan on the shores of Lake Geneva, uh, which after we'd gone over several times and looked at the appropriate places, but this is the first bilateral between the two most powerful uh, leaders in the world. Uh, we landed on this sort of modest style, but very elegant villa right on, on the lake. And then another place for the bilateral meetings to take place, which was an adjacent villa. Uh, we looked at a lot of houses. We looked at the house, I remember a very modern house in Geneva that was built by 
uh, the man, the couple really, who founded Learjet Corporation. You know, there were a lot of interesting places that we got in to see, which was kind of fun. But anyway, we ended it at this place, and I had asked the um, Aga Khan, who loaned us the house, to leave some of his household staff and his chef and so forth, because we were entertaining the Gorbachevs, and, and it was back and forth between the two compounds. But we had a little bit of time before the Gorbachevs arrived for dinner. And I remember sitting in front of a roaring fire in this villa, it was kind of cold, and uh, just with the president alone. And I said, we were just talking about a lot of different things, in particular related to this bilateral meeting. And I said, what do you think really will bring down totalitarianism and what will be the final blow? How will it really be accomplished? Now, had he asked that, or had that question been asked of him, perhaps in a press conference or in a public forum, or if his surrogates had answered it, there was this traditional answer, strong buildup of our military defenses, and blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. <laughs> this is not what Reagan said to me. Reagan said to me, Jim, the way totalitarianism will be brought down is by the people's desire to know God. Now, you can imagine I did not rush out to tell, tell anyone, uh, any journalist, what the president just said to me, but it, in a way it was this quiet interior that he didn't talk about that was percolating right along and really created this grand strategy that he had. And what happened? The story didn't end there. The truth was that the overthrow of the domination of totalitarianism really was grounded in uh, the religious liberty that was sought in the churches in Eastern Europe. And you know the rest of the story, but this has been well documented. So Reagan had a feeling that this was the way it was ultimately going to happen. Yes, did he know that we had to have a strong military buildup? Yes, did we have to do all of these other things? Absolutely, but this was the Reagan way. Secondly, information. He was tutored by a woman named Suzanne Massey who had really spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union, really came to an understanding of who the Russian people are and what they really wanted versus what the totalitarian system uh, represented itself as being. She trained Reagan, she explained to Reagan the heart and the mind and the culture of the Russian people and what they sought. That gave Reagan an added capacity when he first met with his Soviet counterpart to really understand him as well. And execution. Execution came when Reagan goes to the wall and says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that's how he said it. So he goes to the wall with his conviction of one, his belief, number two, his understanding, and number three, he had built, he had started to build this bridge with Gorbachev, so there was a mutual understanding, so that when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, Gorbachev knew exactly that Reagan meant what he said. He expected, and he saw that wall came coming down, and ultimately it did. Number four. I know I'm going on here, but I, I really want to share these points with you. Uh, Reagan believed in American exceptionalism. Okay, we hear American exceptional, American exceptionalism, but he didn't believe that Americans were any better than anyone else. He believed that the ideals of America were what were exceptional and what the rest of the world needed. Um, he explained what he meant uh, really, in the end, I think, most effectively, when he talked about that imagery of the shining city on a hill, uh, which was both a patriotic and a biblical illusion. He referred to this shining city, he called America, everywhere he went. And he made a consolidated statement about it uh, from uh, the Oval Office in his last address. And I just want to read, um, this is the proof copy of my book, mm -hmm. but I, I just want to read, because um, I've included this passage. i just read a paragraph to you, but this is what he said as outgoing president. Um, and I, I think it's uh, tremendously, it just says so much about who he was and, and what his beliefs were. And you may remember this. In the past few days, 
when I'd been at that window upstairs, which uh, was the window in the blue room that looked out over the monuments. I thought about that shining city on a hill. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man. And by the way, you know, Ronald Reagan always called himself citizen president, mm -hmm. which I like. Because we can all think of ourselves as citizen activists, as Andrea said. He journeyed here, this is speaking of uh, Winthrop, he journeyed here on what today we call a little wooden boat, and like other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the Shining City all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I, what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, wind-swept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace, a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get there. That's how I saw it, and that's how I see it still. That was Reagan defining for us his belief in American exceptionalism. And lastly, Reagan loved America more than he loved himself. In fact, it was said that the Reagan presidency was more about America than about Reagan. For our future, we're gonna need more patriots like this and fewer celebrities. Reagan grew up on self-sacrifice. You know, Reagan, the Reagan family never even owned a house. They, they, they went from rented place to rented place and the first time his parents ever even owned a home was after he was in Hollywood and he brought them out to Los Angeles and bought them a small house. Um, I always thought it was interesting to compare, uh, speaking of this um, being about America and not Reagan, I always thought it was interesting to compare Reagan and Thatcher. Reagan never believed the success of his two terms was due to him. He accredited the American people, built them up, made them believe they could always accomplish great things. and. And that's really what we need to have for the future. Americans who are confident they can do better tomorrow than today. But Thatcher, with a similar religious upbringing, she was a Methodist, Reagan was a member of the Disciples of Christ Church, but both had parents who were substitute ministers. Both grew up in a very, very religious context. But Thatcher departed from Reagan's belief that he was only acting a providential role. Thatcher, though she, she understood it that way, came to believe more in herself. And it's interesting to see that today, Thatcher, unfortunately, despite her enormous consequences and accomplishments in Great Britain, is reviled to a great extent while Reagan continues to rise and is in the top of all five presidents. So this is embodied also in that last and in conclusion here, the last, the other statement that he has in that hand tool, um, the other plaque on the Resolute desk, which said that uh, there's no limit to what a man can accomplish or how far he can go if he doesn't care who gets the credit. That also is really the label you can put right on Reagan and, and leave with him. Um, there's just one thing, one more quote I'd like to leave with you, and um, I think that the um, that idea of not getting credit is something that also really can resonate with millennials today because they're really all, again, about what they can accomplish. Uh, Reagan filled everyone with hope, not just Americans. And I wanna close with a portion of a quotation from my very favorite Reagan speech. And uh, this was given at a castle in Germany and it was all about uniting because he worked very hard to bring about the reunification of Germany. And we found a castle uh, way up in the Bavarian Alps. It was sort of fog and shroud for him to give this speech to a youth encampment. And again, this is an example of Reagan speaking directly to the people. There were thousands of young people there. And I decided to go out in the crowd and just take 
a measure of how the crowd was responding to this. And um, you'll see why this is my favorite um, speech, and I, I think it's heartening for today. Your freedom, your future, awaits you. So take up your responsibilities and embrace your opportunities with enthusiasm and pride in Germany's strength. Understand that there are no limits, no high each of you can climb, no, no, no limits to how high each of you can climb. Let us ask ourselves, what is at the heart of freedom? And the answer lies the deepest hope for the future of mankind and the reason there can be no walls around those who are determined to be free. Each of us, each of you, is made in the most enduring, powerful image of Western civilization. We're made in the image of God, the image of God, the creator. The future awaits your creation. From your ranks can come a new Bach, Beethoven, Goethe, and Otto Hahn for Germany's future. My young friends, believe me, this is a wonderful time to be alive and to be free. Remember that in your hearts are the stars of your fate. Remember that everything depends on you. And remember not to let one moment slip by. For as Schiller has told us, he who has done his best for his own time has lived for all times. Thank you for your patience, I appreciate it.